Things are going to start happening to me now. You've done all the reading. You're a scholar. You're a professor. You've done all the reading. You've done the intellectual heavy lifting. Or less, eat shit and die. You wouldn't know a fact if it begged you all night long. Want to like, um, you know, give the wrong impression because I am, I I am very high. Can ran up behind him with a hatchet. Smash, smash, smash. Yeah, care. I'm a libertarian. What I'm getting is, did why? you vote for Joe Jorgensen or Trump? Who? That's Joe the, Jorgensen. That was the perfect answer. Thank you. <laughs> that was and welcome everybody to the Libertarian Podcast Review. This is a different show we're going to do. You normally we we don't go off the rails so much, but we have look. Uh, just last week, I with Clint Russell, we talked about. The, the breakdown, the mental breakdown of our one and only, um, what's his name, Pendulet, okay? He's heroes out there. Well, if you have a hero, so maybe Scott Horton is your hero, maybe Andy's your hero. We're gonna say, don't glob onto heroes, they may lead you wrong. Scott Horton, welcome to the Libertarian Podcast Review. I, I appreciate you coming on, and, and Andy, of course, as well. Yeah, happy to be here. So, first of all, Scott Horton, you are the director of the Libertarian Institute, the editorial director of antiwar.com, a host of other things. Uh, Andy, uh, do, what are you? Uh, a garbage man. <laughs> okay. Do you have any books coming out? I know that uh, Scott has, has some books. Scott, maybe you can talk, talk to us real quick about your Libertarian books uh, and, and what you do at the Libertarian Institute. Before we get into the main topic, which is we're going to talk about skateboards, um, we're going to first, I'm going to play you with some clips and I want you to react to them. But first of all, tell us exactly what you do and uh, why you are uh, the legend that you are. Oh, well, I don't know about that, but uh, I uh, do a show. I got uh, 5,000 something interviews going back to 2003, uh, almost all libertarian anti war stuff. And then um, I wrote some books. I wrote Fool's Errand about Afghanistan and enough already about the war on terrorism, which. That's the best I can do is enough already if anybody wants to read that. And then um, I got a couple more. One of them is a collection of my interviews with Ron Paul. And then the new one is a collection of interviews that I did with different experts about nuclear weapons uh, over the last like 15 years or so. It really covers all aspects of nuclear weapons called Hotter Than the Sun. And um, I'm on the radio in Los Angeles on Sunday mornings. And I do a podcast at Scott Horton's show. Everybody can sign up for the feed there. And then I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, which is... A great group of guys and one gal so far. Uh, a lot of great writers and podcasters, basically. Um, and we publish books, um, including we just published a great one by Keith Knight that's called The Voluntarist Handbook, a collection of great an uh, great anarchist writings. And uh, uh, oh, and I'm the editorial director of antiwar.com. Last but not least, antiwar.com, which is really the most important project on the internet even though the front page looks like it was made in 2004, which is true. Um, it's, <laughs> that, that uh, late. It, okay, I was thinking earlier than that, but yes. Yeah, we, we got all the bad news for you every day. We got, you know, the great Dave DeCamp and Jason Ditz uh, writing up the news and really along with uh, Connor and Kyle, uh, Connor Freeman and Kyle Anzalone as well, writing up the news and uh, picking out all the viewpoints for you every day and our, our stable of in-house writers other than uh, our fearless leader, Justin Romando, who's been dead for three years now, uh, is other than that, um, it's as good as it's ever been with Ramsey Baroud and Ray McGovern and Ted Carpenter and Doug Bondo, who are the two best guys at Cato, and uh, Ted Snyder, who's this great analyst from Canada and all these great people. So um, that's all the bad news. That's the most important thing. That's what I should have said first, antiwar.com. Okay. Let's, let's move there. Andy, I see you have a Thrasher shirt. Scott, you're into skateboarding. Maybe maybe we'll start with Scott. How you did see you see my shirt? I got Public Enemy today. Okay, well there you go. I've got my Independent. I don't know what. Tell us. About Are you a Chuck D guy or a Flavor Flav guy, Scott? I'm a Chuck D guy for sure, dude. Right. Well, I mean, I was 11, I think, when I first started listening to him. So I was a Flavor Flav guy first. But then, you know, yeah, I'm a lyric reader. You know, how old are you? If you don't mind me asking, I'm 46. Okay, so I'm I'm 51. Andy is like 15. I don't know how old he is. Yeah, Andy. he's just a kid. I'll be, 
I'll be 32 this year. Okay, so okay. Uh, skating for him is a little bit different. Skating for you, Scott, is a little bit different. I was never a great skater, but I was totally into it. I've got It'll the... be 22 years for me this year. Skating. Well, okay, well, good. I, I I graduated high school in '89. I went in uh, near Santa Cruz, so our oh, high great. school actually built a half pipe. Okay, it was a private high school, raised money for it, put this half pipe up. Roscop, a bunch of. Uh, oh, yeah. locals came and skated Dude, it. He was so See what bad. happens when you privatize everything. Right. The, the Rob is the, is the legend, dude. Oh he helped God. build this ramp too, by the way. And then they, they tore it down because uh, like kids were getting hurt. So uh, I was up for two years. It was fantastic. I, I barely, I dropped in once or twice, tore myself up. That's as good as I got. So, but I was around the whole thing. Scott, why don't you tell us how you got started with skateboarding itself? And uh, like at what age? And then um, did you have like certain people that you looked to and you tried to do different, you know, tricks of theirs? Were you a vert rider? Were you a uh, flat? Were you a uh, Rodney Mullins type? What what was uh, Scott Horton? Hmm. Man, so we're going way back now. Well, I need so to know um, the, the back, back backdrop. Yeah, I want to know your first board, too. What was the for, right. first board you got? He's got it. This is an exclusive Sims. right here, Sims. Okay. It was a Bearflex Ramp Rat, but uh, was I um, what year was that? Uh, the board model was probably at eighty six. Okay. Um, and then so, I got that. I got that from my buddy Jimmy in uh, in the spring, I guess, early summer eighty seven. So I was about to turn eleven. So this was when I was like, okay, I don't play with toys anymore. Now yeah. I'm a big kid and I, you know, ride skateboards and whatever. And so all the big kids in the neighborhood that summer were all about skateboarding. At first I was resistant because it's so much slower than a bicycle. Yeah. And my neighborhood, it was like pretty far to get anywhere. Like, man, I'm going to have to push, push, push around on a skateboard. Like just, ah. And then what happened was, um, I think one time me and my buddy, uh, the same guy gave me that board. We were supposed to go hang out, and then he didn't show up because he was off skateboarding with the big kids. And I was like, oh, man, I got to catch up and whatever. So I got his board. He got a new board. He got a David Hackett Madrid hand-me-down from the bigger kid down the street. And then I got his board, which was that one I just showed you. was a Veriflex Ramp Rat was the first board I ever had. And um, but the first pro board I got was, I don't know, maybe that Christmas or it might have been later that summer or something. I don't know. I got the my first pro board was a Gator, Vision oh. Gator Mini. And are you, you know, are you free Gator or Mini models? Huh? Are you on the are you on uh are you on the free Gator train or anti free Gator? Keep oh going. no, Keep man, going. no. He should just kill himself and then that'd be the end of everybody else's problem with him, man. Screw <laughs> what's him. what's wrong with Gator now? I don't I don't know the story. Oh, he murdered his oh. uh, girlfriend's best friend. Okay. And then uh, he went off the rails. In the desert. He, he was went, like, uh, a top pro them. right there with Hasoy and Tony Hawk right when they were coming up. So he could have been Tony Hawk. No, Gator was good. Gator, Gator. Yeah, was, he uh, was. Yeah, he was one he of the was, best. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, seriously. Like the if it hadn't had been, if it hadn't have been for Hawk and Hasoy just absolutely dominating the top, it really could have been a free for all, and it really was like below those two. It really was always a free for all for third, fourth, and fifth between Lance and Gator and Chris Miller and, you know, maybe Ross Scott for a while. Um, well, and a couple others, Blender. Uh, as an example, when the, um, well, there are a few things changed, right? And we, we're kind of jumping through here in history of stuff though. Yeah. Uh, what is it, 85, 84, uh, McGill does the McTwist, right? Yeah, 85. Transforms that, so he's suddenly winning. Caballero had been winning up until then. He can't do it until he does his Caballero, right? Which is three or so, four years later, where he starts to, to innovate. So these different innovations, but always at the top was Sasoy and Hawk, always learning and then pushing forward. Yeah. What, what Did you skate ramp then? Yeah, so. Early on? Um, and what it, where did you grow then, up? Yeah, all the kids quit in the neighborhood, except, you know, like three of us. All the other kids were like went with whatever was in style, the fad in and out or whatever. But for, there were three or four of us who decided that like, nah, this is who we are now. And and you know what it was too, man, I'll tell you. It was um, uh, at the beginning of sixth grade. So that was at the end of fifth grade. So then after that summer, the beginning of sixth grade, the coolest kid in sixth grade had a party at his house. 
and all the cool kids are downstairs, French kissing and whatever. I'm upstairs all by myself watching a TV that's like this big. And it's uh, on tape is the search for animal chin. <laughs> yeah. And like Let's when I go. got there, it was almost over. And then I re I rewound it and rewatched the whole thing. And then I rewound it and rewatched the whole thing again. And it was just as unreal. I mean, I'd never seen any. That's like probably the first time I'd ever seen footage of pros riding a half pipe. And it's. The Bones Brigade riding the chin ramp. And I'm right. just like, what? So at that point, I mean, maybe I had seen a couple of pictures of something before. I don't know. I might have seen a, a thrasher by then. But when I saw that movie, that was it. Like, that was, okay, this is my identity from now on. It's like, I am a skateboarder forever. And then I did. Like, I, I was just, I stayed hardcore. And then, so there was Lone Star Skate Park. Um, I first skated in, would have been, like, Maybe not until the next year. Maybe not until like the spring of 88. So I go to Lone Star. And that was the Texas flag ramp. Had a Vision Streetwear logo on one side and the Texas flag on the other. And I went there and saw Tony Hawk versus Jeff Phillips. Oh. You know, battling it out, you know, like in person and all that in 88. A couple of times that that kind of thing happened there. Um, and then, yeah, that was where I really learned to skate. And that was just ramps. They had a little ant ramp, three feet high, eight feet wide. And then they had the vert ramp. And then they ended up building a five foot, 16 foot wide, five foot. And um, and then I still suck, though. And in fact, my friends dropped in on vert, but I never did drop in on vert on Lone Star. I was afraid to drop in on vert on Lone Star. I still dream about it. I'm such a coward. But uh, the next skate park after that was Dillo Park. And they had, uh, first of all, a mini ramp on the inside that was I still dream about this all the time. Like this is if I ever won the lottery kind of thing, this the first thing I do is rebuild this ramp. It was 24 feet wide with a 16 foot wide spine. And then next to it was a 12 foot wide hump bump. And then with an eight foot extension, it was so good that ramp. And then eventually they built a vert ramp out back, a big steel vert ramp uh, called the mother earth ramp. And that was the first vert ramp I ever dropped in on. And you know, I was still a little kid. I was like 14. So I could do like early grab backside airs at coping you know, stuff like that. I couldn't do a rock and roll on it. It was so big and I was so little. And I, by the way, like when I was 14, I probably looked like I was 12 or less. Like I was right. a little bitty kid. So were, were you, well, you know, um, I think Tony Hawk, Hosoi, I think cab turned pro at 12. Those guys were like 14. I mean, they're, they're little kids. That's like what you're saying there. Could you, <laughs> could you have at all competed? Uh, to oh, no, no, no. I mean, no. I mean we're obviously the best in, in the land. Yeah. Like, well, first of all, Del Mar was only eight feet deep. No, I'm just kidding. Look, I mean, those guys are those guys are like Jedi Knights, right? It's like the yeah. difference between a guy who can shoot a hoop versus a guy who is, you know, the top pick in the NBA or something like that. It's a level of skill. And and frankly, like among my friends, I'm not good. You know what I mean? Like I'm purely always been middle of the pack. And I got I got bros of mine who are still friends of mine uh, who have real talent. Who could have been pro? Who was talking about you, least, Andy? You know, maybe right on that line. <laughs> no, Scott. Scott actually will outrip me on the vert ramp, but that's a different end culture, right? Because I'm younger. We didn't really have the backyard ramp skate scene, so I had to wait for parks to open up, and you know, traveling and road tripping, which is a big part of every skater's journey. But trying to hit every park you can and and a 75 mile radius or whatever. Yeah, right. We've done some of that too. You know, we had the well. See, before we got the vert ramp. It was the Wednesday night skate crew, and we'd go everywhere and hit Lockhart and go to San Marcos and whatever and hit all the different parks. But once we got the vert ramp, then it's just Wednesday night <clears throat> vert crew, you know, and that's all it is. Did you do? But I'd dredge on a mini ramp, son. You better look <laughs> out for me. But, but on street, I mean, you saw me yesterday at that hump, hump, hump track thing. I'm like, I was afraid at first. I'm old. But I'm excited to get back up there. I, yeah, once I get good at that thing, I mean, so do you know about that? I mean, we're skipping around here, but no. they, it was my buddy, John Altman. I, I I texted with him tonight. It was my buddy, John Altman, who I grew up with skateboarding ever, you know, who I first met in 1990, is the guy who built that, Andy. And uh, Oh, no way. Is that yeah. the guy who has the uh, the compound I went to the party out with, with my daughter? Uh, no, but he was there. Uh, no, okay. that's Doug King. That's Doug King. Okay. But I'm sure John was there that day, though. Um, but... So he's, um, you know, he used to work at the skate park of Austin, which was like, I'm going to say 2000 through or 2001 through 2000, 
08. It, it ended at the very beginning of 08. It lasted through 07 and it ended at the very beginning of 08. Something like that. Bush years era park. And he worked there for a long time. I mean, I've known him f- since forever. He's from Wichita Falls. Um, and, uh, and there's a whole crew of guys from Wichita. Um, and, um, but after Skate Park of Austin closed, they went out and their mission is just building concrete skate parks for counties and cities all across Texas. And yeah. I, I lost count of them. He corrected me. I can't remember the number anymore, but it's... Do you know what the, the name of the like company he worked for? ...that he's built across Texas. Go ahead. Do you know what the name of the company is that he's working for? Um, or- I mean, it was skate park of austin so it was like spa something okay yeah yeah i've seen them i've seen them on social okay. media and i try to keep up with it concrete disciples used to have a pretty good map but it's like they haven't updated their website in forever it's oh just yeah not, yeah no i should look that up i should look that up and see because you know i forget the number now hell let me let me see what I'm gonna, how I'll, are the, how are the right skate- now and ask him how many of these things because frankly like I, I gotta tell you man so like so this guy, me and him just grew up skateboarding together. He's a couple years older than me, and he's way better than me. You know, he's always been a hero of mine kind of thing. We were roommates for a long time and all this and that. We were cab drivers together. And um, then, you know, when the terror war stuff all happened, like he just really focused on skateboarding, and I really focused more on radio <laughs> and anti-government type activities and things. Um, and so, you know, I always saw him around and whatever, and we were always bros. We never did have a fight, but we just kind of grew apart because we just had different priorities all the time and that kind of deal a lot, you know, whatever. Um, and um, so then it actually, you know, happened that I didn't see him for like 20 goddamn years or something or like, you know, maybe ran into him a little bit or I heard kind of rumors of him. I really went a long, long time without seeing him. And then I was like looking up some stuff on Facebook or something and somebody had a link to it or something showed me where they had like a collection of not all, but many of the concrete skate parks that these guys have built all across Texas. And they're just, and you can't, what are you going to do, dude? It's public land. Unless there's a nuclear war or whatever, it's, it ain't going to be anarcho capitalism. This is all public park land where owned by counties and cities where these guys took bulldozers and carved these gigantic scars into Texas and then layered it all in concrete better than any ditch you ever grew up skating when we were boys. Right. And they're going to last forever. They're made to last for a hundred years, for 200 years. I mean, there are generations of boys who are going to grow up being skateboard friends, riding than a tennis court and building, (laughs) you know, their lives. Like, and this is going to be, there's going to be thousands, maybe, I don't know like how to do the math on it. Right. Tens of thousands of people are going to have the time of their lives on these things. And and for years, they're going to grow up together, young kids skating these things. And well, not we, just boys either. Girls too. I see right. it every day on r slash skateboarding. Young girls killing it. Young right. girls doing stuff I can't do. Backside kick, flip down six stairs. Screw you, dude. I can't do that. I could never do that. On my At my best, I couldn't do that. You know? So, um, uh, so to me, like, you know... Uh, a guy who, like, to to anyone else would seem like some kind of deadbeat who lives in this little trailer and, like, drives around doing small construction jobs and has no family and not much of a life and whatever. Actually, look at him, dude. He's the greatest hero ever. He's a greater hero for Texas skateboarding even than Jeff Phillips. This guy built 50 fucking concrete permanent skate parks all across this land. That's, like a, that's a beautiful thing about comes, skateboarding. They'll still be there, you know? <laughs> that's a beautiful thing about skateboarding, you know? It Each is. state kind of has their own history, too, and that's like... Oh, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and Texas Tennessee. has a proud history. And, like, here, my buddy, John, is, like, he's the greatest Texas skater ever. The only, way, you know? the only concern, like, if you go back, so you talk about giants in this sport. I think one of them is Stacy Peralta, okay? Sure. Who, who took this, you know, he was a great skater himself, and then creates the Bones Brigade and then Powell Peralta. And because in the early 80s, it was a big deal. And then it just blew up. And as far as the bad way, like a nuclear bomb hit skateboarding, uh, yeah. they were they destroyed these parks. So these skate parks that they had had, that's kind of what led to all these backdoor or backyard ramps and everything. So I hope you're right. You know, there's I think the X Games is something that really, you know, transformed and it really yeah. made someone like Tony Hawk super rich. And why, by the way, at the same time, uh, Christian Osoy was transporting a pound of meth. <laughs> and yeah, that's why he was... yeah, he he threw his 1990s away, unfortunately. Right. But look, I, I mean, on, the, on that money. earlier era, 
on that earlier era of concrete parks. I mean, those were all privately owned parks. And what yeah. happened was they changed the law in California to make it easy to sue them all out of yeah. business and they couldn't get insurance. And I guess the law said they had to have insurance. And of course, no one would insure them because Johnny's going to break his arm. What are you stupid? Just, you know, but you needed like an ironclad waiver. And essentially yeah. the law didn't allow for a waiver that was good enough to allow them to be in business. So um, that was what happened there. But in this case, this is like, are those tennis courts you like at the government park, right? Not a private country club or something, but at a government park, are those tennis courts still going to be tennis courts in 70 years? Yeah, probably they are. They're still going to be sitting right there. I mean, maybe someone will purpose them to somebody, something else, but it'll still be a public park and it'll still be that land right there. And that's the same thing with these skate parks. Skateboarding is not going away. And the quality of the build here that we're talking about in, you know, these aren't wooden ramps with Masonite surface. Yeah. This is concrete, you know, permanent gonna, structures, absolutely permanent structures made to last long after my boy John is dead. These things are going to live on and on and on and on and on for decades and decades into the next century for sure. You know, if public it's, park, if it's public incredible parks to are, think of, you know, public parks are going to exist. They all better have a skate park and a concrete. Yeah, I mean, and not, some of them, not prefab. Right. Do you some want to Charlie Kirk out there those. policing the, the weed though? Do what? <laughs> Do you want Charlie Kirk policing the weed at these parks? Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that is the one. That is the real problem with it. Actually, is that I'm a, the biggest hypocrite in the world. Is because like that's just like in the world of skateboarding. In truth, like I don't think there should be any public skate parks or parkland at all. And really, like, I really resent being forced to pay for other people's tennis courts. Why should they have to pay for my skate park? And I really also don't at all like the fact that instead of Jimmy's dad saying hey put your helmet on kid it's the deputy sheriff yeah and you know if you talk back to him you don't get thrown out of the park you get your ass beat and taken off to juvie and it, you <laughs> yeah. know it's a government public means government right so what are these they're government skate parks it's bad as yeah. it is you know for what it known, is. Known i'm still proud of, of them because and they are still very <laughs> permanent and yeah. they are really badass so but it is true ones? that yeah the enforcement comes you know, at the hands of the state. So like how long, hell, it may have already happened that a cop shot somebody at a public park. I wouldn't be surprised, you know. Do, do you have good uh, skate parks near you then, Scott? Yeah, there's, um, you know, I don't hit them that much. Like, I, I'm too old and, and have too much to do to skate that much. So we pretty much, I just stick to my one vert ramp with my buddies. But there's a, the Round Rock Skate Park near here is really actually scary as hell. Um, giant concrete thing. It's like 10 feet, 12 feet deep or something. 11. Wow. Oh, the big the cradle and all this. I yeah. can't skate that thing. You should see my buddy Altman skate that thing. Holy crap. Dude, he went up over the top of the cradle and did some, I can't remember what the hell it was. Anyway. Was 10, 10, 11 o'clock on it or what? No, no, no. Like I'm saying over the top of the back of the thing. Oh yeah. Cause it does have the rollers on the back yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. But, um, and then, uh, there's, you know, here's the story. House Park in downtown Austin at 12th and Lamar or 15th and Lamar is named after Colonel Edward Mandel House, who was Woodrow Wilson's Cheney. And it's named after him because he lived in a house that they called the Mandel House house right there on. I think it was San Gabriel, one of the streets right there off of 15th. And that's where House lived when he was writing the book, Philip Drew, Administrator. His oh. blueprint for wouldn't it be great if America was a fascist dictatorship and I <laughs> yeah. was the dictator, which became I knew there was the a blueprint. reason I hated that park. Yeah, dude, seriously. <laughs> and that became the blueprint for the fascist state of the wartime economy during World War One under Woodrow Wilson. And the guy, you know, he wrote the whole thing about his dream. And, you know, when Mussolini was first famous, um, but before he was an official bad guy, uh, House complained that I anticipated Mussolini by several years. And so, you know, like his, Mussolini was stealing all the credit that and he was the one who had invented fascism and he wanted credit. And of course, this is the same scheme that later became known as the New Deal. That's right. <laughs> fascism in America. Um, Public works. Andy, I'm confused. So you have a Thrasher shirt. It seemed like you would have had a trans world. Did you ever? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no. I, shout, all right. So let me give my Tennessee shout outs because not... Not many Tennessee boys make it in skateboarding. And my nice boy, job. Jake Jake Wooten, pro for Santa Cruz right now, just okay. dropped a Red Bull Park 
for uh, today. He just dropped a pro Red Bull skateboarding part today. So oh. if you get a chance, go check that out. Some one of the best rippers in the country, if not the hey, world. Send me that later, right man. Out today, yeah, I will. Um, That's cool. And Britt Parrot, one of the best editors of Trans World of all time, another Tennessee boy. So cool. I do have my, I do have Trans World respect. <laughs> I'm course. losing respect by the day for Thrasher. They endorsed Beto O'Rourke. What uh, for president and last uh, <laughs> the last presidential run, and they really. <clears throat> Since um, Phelps have died, passed away, he uh, they've really taken a progressive turn. But you know, so much of skateboarding has sold out to corporations. You can't find hard or soft goods hardly anymore in skateboarding that are made in America. Yeah, but I mean, Simon's an Austinite man. I don't know. He's a good dude. I know, or I used to know him back a long ass time ago. I doubt he even remembers me. But the artist Michael Sieben or yeah, Sieben? or Sieben. Yeah, I don't know how to say it. But yeah, I mean, he's an Austin guy, and is he editor right uh, now? Uh, I think he is. Like the you know, uh, well, I don't know if he's editor. I think he's like second place, but that means he's actually the one doing the work, right? Thrasher still does a lot for skateboarders. You know, it's like a double edged sword. I'm not really a fan of. I gotta admit, I let my subscription lapse. Um, it wasn't. To, it wasn't deliberate though. I didn't notice anything too commie in there, but I guess I wouldn't be surprised. You know, yeah, that's... very commie era. I saw him making fun of some of that stuff too, though. I mean, it is still Thrasher. There yeah, is. Yeah, uh, the, as far as skateboarder, die, but it sounds like they're going to die now. Oh, sorry, go. Ahead. As far as skateboarder magaz skateboarding, like diehard skateboarding magazines now, which are almost dead. As far as like all all paper medium goods, as far as mm -hmm. entertainment media, Trans World's news. gone, isn't it? Transworld's been yeah. gone as far yeah. as I know. There's some smaller zines. Thrasher, I haven't had a physical copy in years, but I still do like uh, Juice magazine. Yeah, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but they sure. they do more long form interviews, which are really great. So that's cool, man. Back, I've been out of the skateboarding world for for years, but um, back in my day, okay, there was two truck companies, really, as you know, Independence and Tracker. What what is it now, and what are you guys riding? I was always a going guy. Well, not okay. all. I mean, I started. I guess my first, my my first board, I had trackers, and I did have GNS trucks for just a minute. But then, by like '89, I was riding uh, Gold Wing Pro Threes, and I've always had Gold Wing since then. On that tweet that you put out today, you could see I'm riding Gold Wing Sidewinders, and kids say to me, "What the hell are those trucks?" I'm like, yeah, they're from 1991, dude. That's why. Do they do they have the dip in the? Yeah. See, I never could. I always hated indies like slipping his, or trackers for that matter. Slipping and sliding around and have to grind up against one wheel, mm -hmm. you know. And I guess I was too stupid to know that what matters is just always be up against your heel side wheel on a front side grind. That makes sense. On a back side grind, that makes sense. Just be up against your heel side wheel on a back side grind. Your whole truck's hanging out over the ramp on a front side grind. It's over the deck, but still, like that makes sense. And get your groove right there next to your heel side wheel, and you're good. And I couldn't oh, ever get that through my head. I was always just grinding my kingpin and going, Err! and just dying. So I just wanted, yeah. So I've always been a going kid my whole life. And and as far as Hawk and Hussoy, really, I was a Tony Hawk guy, but also I was a Jeff Phillips guy because mm. Jeff Phillips was always kind of right there with the two of them, too. So what and, what made you like uh, Hawk over it? Because uh, people, uh, maybe they're tuning in. Hawk was very technical, right? And yeah. He had all the little tricks. And then Hasoy was just let it fly. Yeah, no, to me it was, I guess my fascination with Hawk back then especially was, it seemed like he must never get hurt and never take time off and never, like, have trouble relearning or relanding anything he's ever landed before. It's like once he lands something, he now has it on lock permanently. It's just one of his tricks. He's never going to have a bad day on those ever again now that he's got them. And so every contest he was in, he'd have three or four new tricks. And Hasoy would be like, dude, here's a nine-foot lean method. <laughs> and Tony Hawk would be like, here's a stale fish frontside gay twist yeah. to Rebert. Right. And it's like, damn, he just did a hard way around stale fish grab five, fakey to fakey five. 
Like, sorry, Pistoy. That's a killer fucking lean method, dude. That's the killerest lean method in the history of lean methods and the history of lean methods that ever will be. And yet, like, this kid learned, and he was just a kid at the time, right? He was a, yeah. a man to me because I was much younger. I was like eight, ten years younger than him. But um, he was still just a kid. And he would invent two, three new tricks every contest. And, and it was just, you know, it's incredible to see. And when you when you know enough about skateboarding to know what you're looking at and know how hard that really is, it's almost not cool, right? It just gets to the <laughs> yeah. point of like, holy crap. It's just yeah. unbelievable to see. Some and, stuff and is... also, you know, that was what, was what it was about Jeff Phillips. Like, I skated with Jeff Phillips in real life. I mean, with him and John Gibson, um, you know, Tex. And and Craig Johnson and and Todd Prince and Ken Fillion and all the fucking Texas skate heroes, Tommy Casel, and these guys would fucking do ten foot airs. And Ken Fillion would do ten foot airs. He went as high as the soy, no problem, every night. You know, I mean, like when they came to Austin, when they skated the Mother Earth ramp, those guys. Uh, I mean, and Todd Prince, all of those guys, and Jeff Phillips. You know, like even at Lone Star and and also, I don't know about, I don't remember if I ever skated with him at Dillo, but at First Power Plant, we had this ramp that barely fit in the warehouse. The decks were this big <laughs> and he hated the ramp, but still he's doing boneless ones like 10 feet high, you know, and he's doing his G.I. Joe, they called it then, the straight leg front side air where his board is like, you know, at the wall, like hitting the put, wall. Or I would against, put Jeff Phillips wheels versus... Against the wall and then, suck his board all the way back in and land that far under the coping and just and the, the guys who are that good are so 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 much better than us mortal men to yeah. sit there and like to stand on the deck and and skate with them or like see them skate in first person like that is unreal i had that same experience later on in life with you know because i'm not from california or whatever these guys are everywhere so it was like you know i'd skate with um we'd see mike crum and chris gentry you know, another couple of great Texas pros, uh, people like that. But um, in notable, like notable white rapper, Chris Gentry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, he was a fool. But then again, it was like, dude, there he is doing like an eight foot stale fish McTwist. And it's like, OK, well, you can be the, the dumbest white rapper on the planet and it's still <laughs> fine. Like he had this ridiculous fake tits girlfriend and all his like crooked baseball hat and whatever. And it was like, whatever, dude, this guy can do eight put fucking stale mctwist dude um but uh oh and then oh at the warp tour one year in 97 they came to san antonio and um we all got to skate with burnquist and mcdonald and neil hendrix oh, wow. mcdonald was just trying like a nolly front side 900 or something i don't know if he ever did land one of those um uh and that was like all he was doing but bob burnquist was like at the top of his game dude with that remember the uh one-footed backside Smith grind to backside revert. I guess I sat there and watched him do that shit right in front of Bob my Bob Berquist is, is, is on a level that is beyond yeah. my comprehension. And uh, Neil Hendricks, too, man. That guy. To answer, so this was always one of my favorite things about, like, the real pro-level skateboarders do, and they're doing high-ass airs, and then they land, like, that far from the edge of the vert ramp. Like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> How do you do that? How, like there, there's some kind of rail they're stuck to. They have so much control that they could do that, you know. And Neil Hendricks, like I don't know how right, how wide the ramp was, 28 or 32 or something. And he's just doing just method to fakies all the way across and landing just right at the edge. And they're you know seven, eight, well, probably six, seven foot method to fakies. And like I know to like a person sitting on the ground, like I don't know, he didn't even turn or spin or like do nothing. But like for a real skateboarder to see somebody do a method to fakie like that and then land with that much precision, like that close to dying, you know, because even the flat bottom of the ramp is like five feet off the ground. Right. You know what I mean? And it's a 12 foot vert ramp, maybe 13. It was a huge vert ramp. Well, you know? I've, heard, I've heard Caballero talk about, um, you know, getting the big air. You've got to you've got to time it just right to almost hit your the deck, the coping and then, you know, drop real close to the so he can carry the speed up to the next one. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to remember, he was talking about some uh, uh, Magnuson. I think he said he can drop down much lower and still get a lot of the height. Tony so, Magnuson. You know, that, 
yeah the, the so, mag yeah so they are they're, they're i mean you're you're correct about being precision uh, you know you hit the flat bottom you're dead uh you hit up too high you're, you're toast as well so uh pretty pretty amazing on uh, yeah i yeah i can't uh, fathom Tyler, you know real um quick, i real think quick, i just wanted and... to answer your question about uh oh. trucks because oh, yeah. i'm a younger guy so oh yeah i started off on shorties skateboard grind king trucks i later went oh, to thunder king. trucks and now i'm riding indy um, they're a little heavier than I'm used to, and I wish they were still made in America. Now, Indy just recently yeah. shipped all their their manufacturing to China. So, my last Probably. board was a Rob Broska uh, face. Uh, kind of, I think they're redoing that. Board I had that well. one. The close up of the melting face. Yeah, yeah, dude, I had that one. Mine was purple. What was yours? It was like a bluish tint to it of Wait. some sort. Um, I had green grip tape. Yeah. What was your first it. board, Tyler? Uh, I don't remember. I, I, I you don't remember? I, I don't because I I was poor. Okay, so we <laughs> and by the way, I was spending all my money on cycling. So I would get a board that my friend would usually give me. He was always giving me some Santa Cruz boards. So this I, is I don't how know. you can I, tell a real skateboarder from a I, cyclist. Yes, I was. I was more. <laughs> by the way, I, I would just say this. What what I get fascinated. I, I so Scott, I, I used to do uh, professional cycling. Okay, and and the, the cycling scene in the U.S. is almost mirrored to um um skateboarding in a sense where you started in the eighties, it was kind of died out. And then Greg Lamont kind of brought it back. And then you had uh, Lance Armstrong, who's kind of like Christian Asoy with a drug problem. <laughs> I mean, you know, all this uh, things going on uh, and the way it kind of fluctuates and blows up and you have these innovative uh, people that, that happen and the traveling around, like these guys would have to do, you know, you do a little race here and your parents help you. And then there's uh, it's a small community. And so I, I, gravitated towards kind of the counterculture of the, the the skateboarding bones brigade was big deal to me because to me they were a little more straight laced than like the the dogtown guys and some of those other little earlier but um did you did you guys ever compete in any of this and, and did you get into oh yeah the yeah i mean when i was a kid it was all contests all the time at the skate parks yeah. and then you know we had the nsa uh you know regionals and all of that and then we had the Texas Amateur Skateboard League for a little while, which my friend's dad set up. So we went, you know, yeah, we'd have contests. We'd go to Houston and Corpus and Dallas and all those kind of things. I mean, that was all like late 80s, early 90s. That was all dead by 91, yeah. 92 when skateboarding yeah, died is... and became tiny wheels and giant pants and little bitty flip tricks and right. the Rodney is... colonization of all skateboarding, <laughs> which, you know, at the time I hated and resisted so badly. Um, Freestyle. and yet yeah, skateboarding had to go through that because it, you know, they needed to somehow integrate all that Rodney Mullen flippity shit into real street skating and yeah. into real vert skating. And it just, it had to start out going that slow, you know, to kind of figure out what really are the limits here, what really works here and what doesn't. And, um, it really wasn't long. Um, it was just a couple of years after that before like Cardiel came barging in, right? And like said, all right, everybody go huge again or you're a pussy and like brought everything back up to full speed, full volume where it belonged. Like that was right by like 93 or 94 or something. I'll um, take a good good skate video part over a good contest run any day of the week. Well, yeah, I mean, it depends on That's, the edit and it depends on the run too. Man, I yeah, see some skateboard on and, it, and also like, it depends if you're talking about a street contest or a vert contest or like a park kind of contrived little setup, sort of fake street course, like street league type thing or what. But like, you know, I was just telling this story the other day, man. Um, When I lived in L.A., I went to the X Games vert contest in I'm going to say like 2011, probably 2010 or 2011. And um. So uh, I don't even remember who won. I, it was probably Bucky Lassick won. It was like Bucky and Bob, and I don't think Pierre Luke Gagnon was there. It was like uh, Lincoln Ueda, probably. No, no, no. He's gone no. by then. Um, I'm forgetting top four. But anyway, point is, Danny Mayer got fourth. Danny Mayer from Omaha. Um, and this guy was so fucking good. It's just unbelievable to sit and watch them. So, like, if like the vert ramp contest that you're thinking of from, like, say, Caballero doing a run, okay? So, everywhere where Caballero would have done a backside air, a mute air, a frontside air, whatever, Danny Mayer does a five. A mute five, a backside five, a stale five, a tail five, a frontside five, 
uh, whatever, a burial, and then a varial kickflip five, and then a varial kickflip to late body varial five, and then like what? Just all the way through his run. Wow. Anything Mike that Frazier. wasn't, yeah, anything Mike that Frazier wasn't is real like, good at this tech, tech vert skip. Yeah, like so he had like a front side heel flip over the channel and whatever. But anything that wasn't a front side heel flip was some kind of 540. I mean, his whole damn run long, and he didn't fall at all. And this is like his full three runs in the finals. And he deserved to get fourth, dude. He deserved to get fourth. Because he was up against, again, I forgot who it was. It, I know it was Lassick and uh, must have been Burnquist, and I forgot who the one more was. And they shredded Danny Mayer, dude. They were so much goddamn better than him. And watching Bucky Lassick at his best, not falling at all and doing every goddamn thing that he wanted to do in a run where it's switch stance, finger flip Madonna and switch stance McTwist. And he did this weird thing. He off the rolling, he would drop in and he would do what you would think would be like, um, like a tail, uh, like a, a tail gap, a tail grab, front side gay twist, but he's like he's coming off his front wheel. So it's really what it is is it's a switch backside nose grab three sixty to fakie. If that makes sense, almost rodeo. But it's no, 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 like, it's just three sixty. No. But it's oh. like think about like just a regular like a backside air revert. It's a okay, backside yeah. air revert, but switch, but off right off the roll in on his first air. It's eight, nine feet out. <laughs> and that is his set up air for the, the rest of the run. And then it's, you know, heel flip front side rodeo, you know, and the rest of this. I mean, he's just. Um, you, you made a comment that, that I'm going to play a, a quick clip here because I, I saw this the other day, um, an interview with Mullen and um, uh, Tony Hawk. Which is oh cool! Oh, I want to of- watch. I love that show, dude. I, when I have time, I need to. I need to subscribe to that podcast. What I need to do, I catch it on YouTube sometimes. Yeah, it's pr- this is pretty good stuff. It's so good. Um, and and you you talk about one learning like street uh, and freestyle and you know look they they didn't like freestyle when it for, and you look back in like the seventies coming up to the eighties, it was dance. Okay, it was it was horrid to watch. Uh, and then Rod, they were doing. Rodney- they were Rodney, doing Sea World cho- uh, choreographed routines right, and shit. Right, uh, Rodney changed all that, but uh, this is a really interesting one about how they uh, learned from each other. Came to Del Mar, you and you and Rocco, yeah. you were the you already the freestyle king. Rocco was just mischievous, yeah, like always causing trouble. Yeah, and you guys came over to watch me skate, yeah. and that is when and where I learned how to do ollie in the airs. Whoa. And I was trying, because I was trying to do it, I was trying to grab oh, late, yeah. and I finally made one in front of you guys. Whoa. You guys were the only ones there watching me. Whoa. And I remember him and you agreeing with him, and, and you're like, that's the future. That is, I remember that's, that's exactly. the future of Ares. And right. I was like, I was like, so stuck I made I've been trying this for a while. Uh, that's Thanks, you guys. Because it's not believe. just the future of Ares. Just, just stop right you. there. Just stop with that. Can you imagine that scene? Like, yeah. so... Nobody knows other than like old kooks like me even understand this. That Tony Hawk really that day, essentially, that he's talking about invented late grab airs. Yep. Like dudes would do sort of kind of what would kind of count as a late grab air where essentially they're popping it into their hand right off the lip or they're grabbing right at the top. But Hawk is such a scrawny little kid. He's got no power at all. He yes. can't get air that way. Yeah. So he figures out what he has to do is he's got to ollie out and then grab late. And then it's funny because they talk about in the biography, new documentary thing that they made about him, which is really great, too, by the way, uh, till, uh, till the wheels fall off. Oh, OK. And um, and they've talked about this before, about how um, whoever it was at the time, you know, Billy Ruff or whoever, all those guys were like, Oh, you're cheating, dude. That's not right. how you do a real air and whatever. And and he was like, well, whatever. Like, I'm too little to do it y'all's way. So <laughs> right. I have to do it this way. And so that was him inventing the leg. Now, here he is telling the story to Rodney. There I was. I did the first leg grab air ever, or at least first leg grab indie air that anyone ever landed. And there was you and Steve Rocco, who, again, absolute legend in skateboarding. So, um, not for his freestyle, but for breaking but, off and creating world industries and the revolution of the 1990s, you know. Um, so let's, let's go on to this. And just to hear them sit there and talk about it. Just to, right. 
just watching them talk <laughs> about that is itself a moment almost as cool as that is. You know what I mean? To me, this is amazing. This is like watching Thomas Jefferson going, and that's when we all signed it, right, Ben? You know? <laughs> right. These guys, uh, that's just real gone. quick, okay. I want to – I want to say I'm anti-freestyling. <laughs> uh, like even as someone who respects them and and the foundation that they laid, uh, Pear Willander and Rodney, I'm just not a fan of theirs. Um, and I'm gonna put that out there. The if if you're in the know in skateboarding and, and basically sabotage industry, there's a reason reason why Vision skateboards existed, and there's a reason why Blind existed. And you can tell why those two names are complete opposites. They kind of had a rivalry there. So, well, yeah, but Per Willander, Per Willander left Powell like right after Rodney did, and created Birdhouse with Tony Hawk. And then and yeah, uh, Rodney created World Industries World, yes, with Steve Rocco. World. Yeah. No, those guys did a lot. I'm not denying what they did. I'm just saying there was they intentionally killed Vert to some Pear degree. Willander I, did. I mean, There's Rodney Mullen did. Mullen, <laughs> Mullen and Rocco did. I don't think Willander did. No, I, I don't think, think that's Willander a bum did. rap on Pear Willander, man. No, I, I don't. You're definitely I'm just right. saying I'm not a how, how did Rodney? I'm just saying I'm not a fan of Pear Willander. Fan. He's Wait, what sick. did he do though? The I don't know all of the insider info because a lot of this stuff goes unpublished. You just have to be you have to know people or whatever. And I've heard stories of people in the industry that talk about Rodney and Rocco and the whole world industries deal going in and like, maybe I'm speaking out of turn. I don't know this for a fact. No, you're right about them. I just don't think Pear Willander was part of that. I think no, Pear I don't Willander. Think, no, I'm not accusing Pear Willander. I'm just saying I'm not a fan of freestyle and I've lumped in oh, I got pear, you. And, pear into freestyle. Well, if you're okay. saying he skated like a fag or whatever, you're right about that. Right, yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah, so, so Andy, uh, uh, let's but wait, wait. The- Let's wait, let me say, let me, okay. wait, on the, on, you got to know about this guy and write this down. Seriously, if you've never seen this, you got to see, I'm sure you can get it on the Pirate Bay. It's called, or it might even be on YouTube. It's called The Man Who Sold the World, but it's a uh, pun, S-O-U-L-E-D. The Man Who Steve Sold Rocco. the World. And it's a documentary about Rocco. And Rocco is exactly what like the Silicon Valley guys would nowadays call a disruptor. He came in to do revolution inside the skateboard industry and essentially committed wholesale cold-blooded murder of Vision and Powell and the old Santa Cruz Combine and all of that stuff, right, okay. circa 1990, 1991. Um, Although and Powell, with Rodney did, Mullen as, I'm, as I'm, his I'm, right-hand man doing it. So are you, I, I, did he have uh, any effect on uh, Stacy just wanting and having uh, his, um, his problems with George Powell? I mean, it sounds like that yes. was... Yes. Okay, okay, so yes. I mean, the way it happened was... Um, he took Rodney, he convinced Rodney to quit Powell and come with him and they're going to create oh, okay. what was called then SMA world industries, which yeah. immediately is picking a fight with Santa Monica airline or right. like maybe they had like a weird deal where SMA was going to do distribution or something. And they were, but then they kept the name anyway and call themselves SMA world industries, like just to troll them kind of. And then maybe they took Nottis from SMA and they and they gave Nottis his own company 101. I'm probably getting this out of order. It was something like this. So then George Powell put out an ad with Hawk and and uh, Mountain and I guess Ray Barbie, mm-hmm. where they're making fun of the small companies and like Tony Hawk's wearing a shirt that's like bad person and whatever. And that's like making fun of like the small skateboard companies. And saying, yeah, but we're this gigantic corporation and you're come today, gone tomorrow, and we're here for the ages and whatever. So then Rocco, yeah, war, it's on like Bugs Bunny. (laughs) Of course, you realize this means war. And so then the next thing he did, it was he put out a line. And I remember when these hit the shelves, too. It was like, oh, shit. It was unbelievable. He put out a line of skateboards that were all just mocking the Powell graphics. So now the skull and the skull and stone or skull and sword skateboard he's wearing a football helmet and he's got a banana and then the tony hawk skull is now a buzzard beak that was the jason lee pro model has a buzzard beak and then 
um, whatever. There are a few more. So now, as they put it in The Man Who Sold the World, now if you got a Tony Hawk at the skate park, you are a total nerd, dude. You are a total loser. You're yesterday's news. And now this is like the wave of the future. So it was like, and he was just Sun Tzu Art of War and went after Powell. And then, the, as you said, Blind is called Blind because they took Mark Gonzalez from Vision and gave him his own company with Jason Lee. And they called it Blind in order to mock Brad Dorfman from Vision because they're, you know, so this was all, it's really a great free market capitalism story um, of like creative destruction. We're like well, this guy. I've heard, I've heard that there's more than just free market uh, creative at, at play here. There's some kind of internal sabotage going on as well. And the by the way, time. Scott, if, well, if you're sure. going to say that, if you're going to put out some sort of ad and to say that um, Tony Hawk is a nerd, I mean, that was that. <laughs> he's self-professed from day one, I think. Sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> no. I'm, well, but having a Tony Hawk skateboard didn't really make you a nerd until then. Gotcha. Like it kind of did. But there were still like people who rode Tony Hawks. How are the birdhouse decks? I don't know if I ever had a birdhouse deck, honestly. I've never um, had one. You know. I don't know what they're on, what di what distribution they're on now. But last I uh, checked, like every major board company is being either made in China or Mexico right now. So. Yeah. Well, as Jake Phelps said, "Hey, cash rules everything around me." So. All right. Let me yeah. let me finish this clip because this I think is a good color. Still collab. Canadian maple. They just ship it over the Pacific and then back again. <laughs> Like, that's yeah, I mean, future. I was just stoked to finally, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. all I did, all I did, grab like yeah. that's not a very that's how far back because that you saying, Yay, I all eat into it, it was probably that's 80, a long time, it ago. was probably 81, yeah, 81, yeah, because yeah. oh, no, I had just gotten on Powell. Do you think having, yeah, Ollie's a control on your Ollie is the beginning of like changing the way you can do aerials? Like if you um, have a yeah. good ollie, can you not <laughs> well, sort of get away I, with? I'm talking about in, in this era, no one did ollie into grabs. The, right. Everything no, was really grab or right at the coping, right? So I was doing that. It was mostly out of desperation because I just wasn't big enough to get that speed. Could that you do a backside ollie yet? Little ones. Okay, but did you? Because you kind of always looked pretty, pretty comfortable in a backside ones, yeah. ollie. Yeah, but but the 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 parallels of our life and how they intersect was that he went. And started doing ollie grabs. Oh, flat. you did. Oh, yeah, That's for right. Sure. Because of you. That's so right. Wait, you did the ollie yeah. India because you saw him because do the ollie yeah. India. Air yeah. walks, no, ollie. and then air walks I went and learned finger flips because of him. Uh, and then he learned air walks. Yeah, because of no, me. Oh, mate. Yeah. yeah, for sure. It was crazy. Oh, so yeah. we would just watch each other. Yeah. Go. I'd go watch the freestyle. Like what? Oh, oh yeah. I'm gonna go try that one. Go up and then and then he come watch me and he's like air walk. Okay. Oh, and then later, Jason Williams the like, funnest stuff is from oh, Ronnie Mullen's got a cool 360 flip. Maybe I'll try that. And then Jason yeah. Lee started taking them to street and doing them over, you know, off of well, uh, curb cutouts and stuff. Th this and, is my point. You know, uh, uh, Andy, you could say they're fake and gay all you want, but I think there's a necessity <laughs> to some of the things, especially when you are such an innovator as Rodney Mullen. Uh, and and then uh, guys like they're obviously friends and you know, you don't necessarily steal it, but you're, you're, Hey, that's an interesting move or something you're doing and then incorporating it. I mean, this is to me, it's a fascinating, I, I'm sure skateboarding is always progressive like this, but this stuff in the eighties, cause I mean, Gelfand figures out the Ollie in like early 79, 80, and then Rodney does it on the flat. And then suddenly everybody's like, it's transformative on the, on, on vert and, and street. Yep. Can I tell this way, into like libertarian? So like, yes. To me, this is like urban and rural, right? Like, you need your farms to come to the the yeah. urban area to sell to market, and yeah. this is like where they kind of they have a, uh, a a beneficial relationship. You know, I don't know what video it is where they show, um, you know, because Rodney was partners with um, Rocco in World Industries, and um, so there's two major things here. First of all. Rodney is the one who came up with the shape of the modern skateboard. Like people were kind of messing around with double kicks and stuff like that. The New Deal had a Siamese twin board and this kind of thing in like 1990. Um, but it was Rodney that said, no, the nose needs to be like a quarter inch longer than the tail and not scoop kind of spoon nose like Powell had. It, it needs to just be, you know, a flat wedge like a tail is with no concave to it. And it needs to be a little bit longer than the tail. And then gave that out to all the world industries kids. And then that was like, finally it clicked that this was the perfect shape of skateboards, which by the way, like anything else that you skate is retro going back to what used to be. Once they came up with the band-aid board shape, 
it, like just a scientific fact. It's just better. And the only difference, the only thing that sucked in is they were so tiny. But eventually they made them bigger. But that's what I'm riding right now. You know, my anti-hero vert board is like, you know, what, seven and three eighths or, or seven and uh, three quarters wide or whatever big old vert board. But it's still that Band-Aid board shape with the nose bigger than the tail and all that. That was Rodney Mullen screwing around in the in the board shop there. And then the other thing was that those World Industries kids really were taking his tricks, like watching his videos and looking at every damn way he ever figured out how to flip that board. And they were saying, OK, this is the inward heel flip and this is the hard flip. And this is the nolly toe flip. And this is the everything like he did invent all of that shit. The only way they were able to do it up a manual pad and then down again was because they were copying him. And then the joke was he refused to skate street, but he's working with Rocco and Rocco's a bully. So Rocco basically just made him. And then they, there's there's footage of this where. Rodney's like dancing around doing his little freestyle stuff. And these I don't know who it is anymore. But some of the world industries boys ride up and they focus his board and then they hand him a, a new one, a street board. And then they hand him a note from Rocco that says, I told them that they could focus your board. And so F you do or whatever <laughs> it is. So they like have a note from the doctor or whatever to do a pass from the boss. And then they hand him a street board and it's like skate street, damn it. And then I think Mullen told the story in one of these things, it, whether I forget if it was Rocco, if it was somebody else who finally convinced him to go ahead and try it. And just start doing his goofy, you know, freestyle stuff at speed. Just take a few pushes and do it across a manual pad, dude. You'd be amazed what you can do, you know? And then that was all. And then I, I don't remember the names of the videos anymore, but the first World Industries video that came out with Rodney Mullen skating street, it was so badass. Had the first dark slides in it and like Casper slides across the manual pad and all crazy well, shit. Well, I, I mean, wonder if that's so good. Uh, you know, him, he, uh, I've read about, and, and he grew up in Florida, and his dad made him like a 12 by 12, like a gazebo size uh, pad. And so he would do his stuff there, and then he would, and people even complained about him at uh, in competitions for not rolling, not 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 moving, you know. So I wonder if that had anything to do with his stagnant um, thing. Uh, yes, that, absolutely. I mean, look, and I think they would say, and like he would say now, like he was a completely autistic kind oh, of freak kid. Yeah. It was like, to him, it was, I don't know if he like came up with just some awesome shin guards and just said like, that's it. I'm going to figure out like mathematically, I don't know, maybe even took out a piece of graph paper or whatever, like every different way I can flip this board. Like if I could, it could do, be a kick flip and a front side shove it, a kick flip and a backside shove it. It could be a heel flip and a backside shove it and a heel flip and a front side shove it. It could be an well, You know how it is. You know how it is being a skateboarder, Scott. Just yeah. you're your own worst critic in, in a lot of ways, and you're willing to uh, endure the pain or whatever. <laughs> like you're willing to take the pain to to make the gain and fall and fall and fall till you get it. Yeah, I mean, well. It'd be a lot easier if I only had to worry about shin guards, right? Like, I don't know. Um, right. But yeah, no, when I was a kid, I always thought freestyle was stupid. Anyway, right. you know, I never was any, you know, I never like, uh, we would all like bounce on our back truck, you know, the where you stand on your back truck and do the pogo on the your pogo. That's it. Though. Oh, nowadays, nowadays you got really Accidental great all, all terrain guys who can skate street tranny and yeah. for it's, and, and you know, I, I respect some of those freestylers for what they did and, and the vert guys too. Like I'm, I tend to be more of like a vert guy myself, even though I never had a vert ramp to skate growing up, but you know, just to see the, the worlds collide, you know, and, and push the push skateboarding into a, a better direction and a whole new yeah. direction. I mean, that was what happened in the nineties. Really? Was like, that's why I say it really sucked when skateboards got tiny and wheels got tiny and, and just skateboarding got very slow and, super technical everybody's done pressure flips and all this crap but it only lasted a couple of years and then when it picked speed back up again then you had you know people like cardiel on you know street and places like yeah. burnside which is more like you know somewhat transition but also very much more like the street culture padless barge at will you know more street style kind of skateboarding um and then um on vert you had danny way and colin mckay 
And they just absolutely showed the way in the 1990s that like, no, dude, you have to flip into your grabs. You can't just do a backside air anymore. You're going to have to put, put they would put some handrail part, handrail tricks in their video yep. parts, too. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I remember the first time I saw Rune Glyphberg do a kick flip to backside lip slide over the channel in a contest. Like, what? <laughs> and that's the kind of thing that that's like a video part trick downstairs, um, you know, in in. Uh, in a video that you get 20 tries or whatever, you know, and what in a mean? contest, he's doing that. And, you know, even Danny way in the first questionable video, the first plan B video, uh, him and Colin McKay are skating, I guess in Vancouver at Kevin Harris's skate park. And they're speaking of evil freestylers, uh, had this awesome vert ramp and they're doing every kind of like shove it to no slide to revert and, and, and kick flips to no slides and, and just basically, like taking street ledge tricks and bringing them up to vert. And so, um, yeah, I mean, and even that was 30 years ago now, right? Like, I mean, um, I think questionable did come out in like 92 and man, if you watch that right now, it's still killer. The questionable video is still just amazing. And one um, of those the, uh, H street guys too. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. What do you think the most innovative, uh, trick or, or, or I would say trick, I guess, that turned into something that was the the one of the biggest stepping stones to the next level, or that's still kind of uh, a, a big deal now. Anything well, it have to be like handrails, that? right? You know, it's like Gons and Nottis figured out handrails, and Johnny Cop, he gets credit too, dude. Hmm. I think he probably did the first caveman handrails or first documented ones. Um, that really did. I mean, I remember I I was around already skateboarding at that time. When it was like, whoa, that's possible. And was that was that the Venice guys? Uh the Venice yeah, Beach well, guys? Um, no, um Nottis was from Santa Monica. Um okay. and and Mark Gonzalez, I don't know, was I guess just from LA. Um Yeah, I think so. And, I'm younger, but my first my like and favorite, Johnny Cobb was from Santa Cruz, I think, or from San Francisco. My favorite early like street part is Ray Barbie. I forget what the, it's a pal Probably video. Domain. Yeah, public domain. Public, yeah, yeah, Barbie. Yeah, he just, killer, he yeah. just has a smile on his face the whole time, yeah. and he's just like leaves his house and he's cruising the whole time, mm -hmm. and it's just something, something special about that. And it's, it's in between, kind of, uh, it, it kind of meshes be between the two worlds really yep. well. Yeah, I mean that's what's really cool about you know what happened in the late '90s and into the 2000s and through today is you have so many of these concrete skate parks, and a lot of them you know started out as just DIY stuff. And you have more official ones now, but you do still have like Burnside um, in was it in Portland, Oregon? Yeah, um, and uh, and there's all different ones up there uh, in the Northwest, and then that is like you know taking essentially street skateboarding culture. Like you talked about the difference between Trans World and Thrasher, where Trans World's like the little league, and Thrasher are like use drugs. Like you know um, these guys. Uh, you know, they're they're the tough guy kind of skateboarders, but they're skating transition, taking it, you know, where where street was was king and, and transition was considered like too pretty or whatever. And then these guys came and made it transition, but made it hardcore. If you look at Burnside and you got to be a tough guy to skate that stuff, that's not Masonite, you know, perfect, you know, back and forth. That's, you know, very kinked, tough and very tight you know, kinked corners and tall vertical. And salute to and those guys. They just started pouring concrete and we're like, we're taking yeah. this over. Yeah. City, what did you, whether you approve it or not, like you can come and tear it down and we're going to keep going. And the good news was too, is they told the city that they were like, well, look, it all just was junkies and dead bodies and stuff back here. And now it's us. So which do you prefer? And they're like, all right, like you guys look like junkies, but well, you're dirty like junkies, but you have upper body strength like you've been eating well. So, OK, you can stay. Uh, that's the homeless now, Scott. They're yeah. just uh, they're like that. Uh, so, I, Scott, you said an hour. We'll, we'll cut out here. Andy, have you ever seen? I got certain... two questions for Scott before we go. Oh, yeah, I'm going to play a clip here. But um, yeah, please talk about before we do this. Oh, you got chin. Oops, sorry. Where, where are we at? There we go. Sorry. What's your question? OK, uh, two on. questions real quick. Who is the most? libertarian pro skateboarder of all time in your opinion and mm. fuck i forgot the other, i've been thinking about it all day <laughs> that's um, what happens my camera i had myself looking like really short this whole interview so 
Paul, are you, Scott? We're, we're doing we got to start over. Fucking thing. Um, I guess I'd have to say Rocco, just based on, uh, as I said, the man who <laughs> sold the world and, and his role in, in using free market capitalism to change skateboarding uh, to the degree that he did and when he did. I'm telling you, if you haven't seen it, it's an absolutely excellent documentary. And it even starts out where like he gets a $20,000 loan from a mobster and they interview the mobster. And the mobster's like, yeah, get off the phone. Like 10 seconds later, this guy's like jumping over my balcony, crashing through my living room window. Like, <laughs> Anyway, the whole thing. So it's, you know, like if I was tedious enough to write an article about libertarianism and skateboarding, like that would, I think Rocco would be the poster boy for like, look, man. And in fact, you know, because skateboarding is a counterculture kind of thing. And it, we grew up in a time where like the Christian right was dominant and that kind of deal. That, you know, skateboarding is very punk rock and punk rock has some kind of right wing and libertarian tendencies, but it has a lot of commie tendencies, too. Yeah. And there's sort of the idea of, you know, being socialist as being against the status quo or, you know, that kind of deal. Um, as uh, I guess you were saying, Thrasher's getting more woke these days and all of that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, skateboarders should recognize like. You know, if I was to write a letter to Thrasher, all of skateboarding, you know, culture and everything all comes from capitalism. It's, yeah. you know, who would have thought if you ever listened to Stacy Peralta open his mouth ever, all he has to say is I was a poor kid from the ghetto and I figured out really quick that I could make my way out of here by skating pools and by helping other young men also skate pools. And then what I do is I'd sell wheels with the other young men's names written on them and we'd all make bank and buy houses, right? And like, in fact, there's an interview, I think it's the autobiography of the Bones Brigade or I can't remember which it is, where Lance Mountain is caught up in the anti-capitalist mentality, basically, as Mises called it, where he's like, Jesus, is this really doing the right thing? Making money, selling skateboards and being happy our whole lives long and all this stuff. It's like, dude, you can't even come up with anything to feel guilty about. <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about? You're talking about thousands of young men, instead of having to have jobs, got to ride skateboards till they were 30 for their living. What's so interesting on that, I heard uh, Steve Caballero talking about, you know, he's, he's about four years older than these guys, but he's suddenly making like two or $300,000 a year, okay? Uh, and he's a 1099. So he's like, it's Peralta and these guys did not tell me to put money away, but he goes, luckily my brother did. Right. And Tony Hawk's like, yeah, my sister was a CPA, same exact thing. Right. And you would think, and, and the conversations were like, yeah, you got to suck, you know, 30, 40, 50% of your income away to pay your taxes. They're like, I always just thought mom and dad file taxes. They just get money back. How come I'm not getting money back? This is a, it was a, a inspirational in a sense that maybe these guys learned a little bit from this. Uh, and maybe Lance Mountain didn't, he was a little older. Right. Maybe he was, uh, he didn't seem quite as bright. So who knows? Yeah. Dwayne I mean, Peter, I'm going to say Dwayne Peters is my most libertarian skateboarder. He may not be, have the entrepreneurship, but just the attitude. Definitely the most punk rock by far. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember my second question. What was your first skate punk show? Like first skate punk rock show that you went to oh uh you know i don't know that's a good question i went you know agony column at liberty lunch i mean they're an austin metal band and when i was in junior high like skate rock meant metal rather than punk like i didn't really listen to punk rock until i was older in fact i was just reminiscing with an old friend of mine about how you know all we ever listened to was metal and rap and then my friend moved to town and he was like what you guys don't listen to punk rock? Dude, you got to listen to punk rock. And then he put on, and we figured it out what it must have been. It must have been the Dead Milkmen. And I was like, this shit is so gay and lame and stupid, dude. I want to listen to this crap. And then so I was like so totalitarian in my judgment that I didn't even want to listen. I don't want to hear nothing about fear or Black Flag or Asian Orange or like anything good you might have to play for me. Because I heard punk rock and it's that whiny boohoo crap that my friend Kevin tried to play for me when he moved to town. So it wasn't until I didn't really start listening to and, and none of the skaters I hung out with did. We all listen to metal and rap. Um, 
And I didn't really start listening to punk rock until like in my later teens. I guess I had other friends that like finally turned me on to more of that stuff. So then as far as shows, I don't know. No effects doesn't count. Did you go to any? I never saw Black Flag or uh, Social Distortion or any of those. That's who I played us in with, by the way, was Black Flag. Oh, I've yeah. seen Anthrax. I don't know. Do they count? Um, they sold out. No, no, no. They're rad. Origin, so. Anthrax is rad, but I wouldn't count them as skate punk. It'd have to be like Devo or Agent yeah. Orange or Black Agent Flag. Orange, yeah. Um, I not. Yeah. No, I... Um, I feel cheated totally. And I, in fact, I, I saw my friend Kevin for like the first time in 25 years recently. Um, me and another friend all went out for lunch. And I was like, it's your fault that I never listened to punk rock until I was 17 <laughs> or whatever, you know. Bastard. Me being a young guy, I got the I got the beauty of retrospect. So I got oh, the, <laughs> the yeah, no, we all listened to Slayer and Metallica and Anthrax and, and Megadeth and all that and when I was in junior high. Guns N' Roses, I admit it. Danzig and Misfits, maybe I would count them. Yeah, some Misfits, not Danzig, not till later. Yeah, that was '90s. I wasn't big into skate punk, but um, I'd love the '80s music. So um, let's. Uh, whoops, I keep screwing this up here. There we go. Uh, so I'm not going to play the volume on this, um, Scott. If you want to talk us through that, I mean, look at this ramp. By the way, they tore it down. They reconstructed it a few years ago, and all these uh, same guys. Uh, what uh, Tommy Guerrero. Cab, Hawk, McGill, and Lance Mountain all re redid their cross thing and uh, over the just the just center. the first backside air and the air out. Oh man, dude, everything <laughs> all about of this. this. Is so good. So that's Guerrero. He's the street guy. Yeah, and he gets a couple of good runs in here. Lance off the, extension. off the extension. I like that one foot front side air too, like a kind of a fake out boneless. I don't think this I ever saw him do that in any other context. Huge gay twist over the channel there, dude. Even today, if anyone did that right now, and that was five, six feet out, that's a huge one, man. Always get gay twist and les twist mixed up. So. Gay twist is mute. Les twist is backside grab. Okay. And, and I heard Cab say that uh, the, the gay Beautiful twist was Andrew. only because they couldn't do it without grabbing. So they said it was gay. Or they're yeah. not going all or, the way around. Yeah, just look gay. Yeah, they were trying to do caballerials. Yeah. It was Neil Blender and Lance. And they're trying this to do caballerials. Cab. They couldn't do them without grabbing. And they're doing they're like grabbing between the legs, mute. So, you don't even have to see the, if you if you can watch this and see who it is just by their style without seeing their faces, then you're a real skateboarder. Oh, OK. Well, then oh, I yeah. am because a cab is, by the way, he's easy to see because he's got kind of the bull legged thing, even at now when he's skating. Yeah. But that's that's total. I mean, style. You could you put all this in silhouette face. and tell who any of these yeah. guys are. For yeah. Their yeah. All very unique. You know, so, Andy, have you seen this movie? This doctor, this video? Yeah, it's been a long time. Obviously, I'm younger, so it's not burned into my brain like you guys, but I still love it. I, it's I'm super pretty, gay. This so is it's right Mike McGill. It's, there's so <laughs> yeah. much homoerotica in this one. They're in the no, bed. there definitely is. Little. You know what's <laughs> funny is it's um, just bros being bros. Uh, yeah, you know I mean, you got that was the way they kind of portrayed like, oh, that's so gay or whatever. They're they're all in the motel room at the pink motel, yeah. but like. <laughs> Dude, a bunch of skateboarders laying around a motel room right. being filthy and sleeping. That's not gay, dude. That's just being a skateboarder. Yeah. I, <laughs> making totally, totally. your way in the world. That's yeah. it, dude. And you're going to make homoerotic humor with your friends. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of gay is. jokes, but right. probably not <laughs> like much of a mess. And and if you see like uh, Future Primitive, you know, which came after this, it was a little bit more just all skating stuff. It wasn't as oh, much. Oh, yeah. No, fun. Future Primitive was before this one. Oh, oh that's it was fine. Before. Okay. Yeah, this Backside is the Backside air one. over the spine. Well, why would they go so homo after Future Primitive then? Well, uh, it was the because, '80s and it was California. You live well, in this California one has a Nile. story. Like the other ones are just they're just. I love the channel videos. jumping, but, but this one they're all on a mythical mission to find Animal Chin, the ancient Chinese inventor of yes. skateboarding, who's you know gone on the lam. Wasn't so they're on Sussex? a mission, so they go to all these different skate spots looking for Animal Chin. So that's yeah. why, because it's the reason it's so gay. It's because it's them trying to act, and they're <laughs> yeah. like. But one of the scenes is they're all like in the motel at night and they're like doing their exercises with their boys and having skateboard dream. They're, they're slam. Oh, look at that backside nightmares. Ollie. Look at that Madonna. Madonna the tail. I'm telling you, dude. Alley oop, Indy, Tony Hawk. And they, coming up here real quick, too. He does like, I think, the one and only real stand up 720 that he did, you know, yeah. for a very long time. Well, there's a, there's a video and I don't, I, I, if you want, we can play it, which is just Tony versus Christian Asoy, and they they go into the finals. And, and Look at that layback air. Oh. That's, that's amazing. 
just fully. And Tony has to pull out. a seven twenty to extend it, and it's uh, it's pretty fabulous. But oh, okay. I, I don't know how much extension. time, how, huh? And that's like five feet of vert or six. Yeah. How much time do if you have, Scott? <laughs> as long as I'm watching this with you boys, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. If you're a skateboarder and your dick doesn't get a little bit hard watching this uh, of any era, then something is wrong with you. I'm sorry. I bet I could do a rock and roll on that. I've done a rock and roll on an extension that high before. I couldn't do an air off it or anything, but I've done a rock and roll and an axle stall on an extension that high, I think. If, if I was with all these guys... That was a long time ago, though. If I was with all these guys at this time right now, you know, if, if I had these guys amp it up the session, I would at least try backside air. <laughs> Dude, they talked about... <laughs> I read a thing about this where, you know, they talked about... Oh, and maybe it was in the... Um, Ugh, it might have been in the channel of the fucking... Yeah, the the grind. yeah. And they talk about how they're all just killing. I mean, all of them are skating as hard as they can. Um, Big twist. There we go. And Lance and Cab and McGill are just absolutely killing. And then they all say that Hawk got on the ramp, and they're all. No, this is something I was reading. I think. Um, and they are talking about how Hawk got on the ramp, and they all just sat there and were just dumbfounded. And this is where he was really coming up, like he, right before you know. So this is filmed in '86. Um, like probably toward, you know, I don't know, the end of the summer of 86, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so they were saying, there's your air walk. You know, he yeah. always was so good, but he was kind of right with them. They were sort of, you know, he would win sometimes they would win sometimes kind of thing. This was the period where he just went nuts. Is this a seven right here? No, no, no. Seven's shot from the other way. Um, but this is the time period where he just went, look at this layback mm -hmm. air. Oh, See, they were all going, <laughs> what? Cause I, it, it doesn't it get the Tuckney invert. And then he you just runs around the other way. And I'll nobody can do that like that, where it's that tuck knee and that, you know, tweaked out Andy, layback. I'll Andy, do you have um, uh, stirrups like that? What are they? Uh, the suspenders? <laughs> no, this is, this is way before my time. I wasn't even bo born when this came out. Um, but I'll give prop props to your Texas guy, Scott. I mean, Jeff Phillips, what, one of the best inverts of all time. It didn't matter whether it was Andrecht and invented his own invert, Phillips 66. So Dude, shout out he to was, Jeff Phillips. Jeff Phillips was something else, man. And I, I mean, honestly, I skated with him. I don't know. And you're not going to find, you're not going to find too many guys my age that know Wait, who going. Jeff Phillips is. Um, And, you know, I sat there and talked with him too, man. When he first quit vision and was just got on BBC he like at Lone Star Skate Park, he sat there and gave me like an hour long lecture about how evil Vision and Brad Dorfman were and why BBC was going to be rad. Remember Bad Boy Club? Um, what feels better, Scott? Uh, beating Bill Crystal in a debate or landing a <laughs> trick you haven't landed in a long time? Oh, I thought you were going to say you're hanging out with Jeff Phillips at Lone Star uh, Skate Park in 1988. Um, that too. That too. We'll put that in the same. Yeah. In the no, I, with Jeff Phillips first. <laughs> But no, skate. I love skateboarding, man. And there's, you know, especially, yeah. There you go. Oh, there, that's it right there. That's the seven. What happened? Oh, man. There we you go. Reconnoiter that thing, man. There you go. <laughs> It'll come back. He does this, the seven here in a second. There's a Perfect gnarly set plant. Yeah. Just invert off the extension. Coming in hot. Dude, you know, Lance Mountain, again, he's always underrated. Hawk and Hasoy, why does it keep freezing up, goddammit? Hawk and Hasoy were so sorry. much better than the other guys that it almost, it wasn't really fair. Like, they should have had a separate contest for Hawk and Hasoy. And then that way, you could have really had a contest between Cab and Lance and Chris Miller and Tony Magnuson and Gator and a few of those other guys who were so good. But there's just nothing that could compare to Hawk and Hasoy. Hawk and Asoy were just super men compared to those other guys. But that's, I mean, it's its not fair, though, really, because Lance Mountain, for one example, is, you know, absolutely among the greatest skateboarders ever. He just was stuck in the shadow of these guys who were just Jedi masters. You know what I mean? What are you going to do if you're Lance Mountain and you can do an, a seven-foot McTwist, but Tony Hawk can do 13 of them in a row? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you're a and if you're a small town boy in Tennessee, like Ray Underhill, shout out to Ray Underhill. I didn't get Make to mention his name earlier. Uh, if you're a small town, small town, Wait, put it back to the 720. God damn it! 
<laughs> if you're a small town boy in Texas or Tennessee, like you, you're looking at these guys like, how do we get a ramp like this right now? We need a ramp like this. <laughs> what can we do? We're going to pull all our money together to get a ramp like this mm -hmm. in somebody's backyard. Hey man, turn it back to the skateboarding. I'm, I'm trying to hang on a second. I was going to play this other part. Um, we'll, we'll skip this one and go. It to... froze up right when he was faking up into that seven. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, he's riding down the same wall again, but 20 feet further this, this way. Is, this is uh, how we uh, keep you interested as far as the, the next oh, episode. Yeah. Will. Okay. Pick me up. Uh, we oh, can, we okay. Can... 87 finals. Right. So. This is uh, Hasoy Hasoy goes wins. In. And by the way, if you talk, if you, you read or if you watch interviews with Lance Mountain, he did not think he was something special. He worked forever to get the McTwist, which then yeah. put him in a position to start uh, doing wins. Um, you know, he was, just wasn't quite like the others. And um, even I still, though, I mean, he was so awesome. If you yes. ever skated with him in real life, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, here's the guy who could do a fast plant all the way across the whole thing, eight feet out, Miller flips and anything and and the consistency. I'm friends with a, a redneck that beat up lance mountain at an atlanta skateboard contest oh really he's, uh yeah his name's load he he's like uh one of grant taylor's mentors hmm. this Here's is what i was talking by about by the way where christian does the biggest lean method in world history and then hawk does the stale fish front side gay twist so now what are you gonna do <laughs> this was sponsored by uh swatch watch if i believe right yeah Swatch was huge back then. And I think or, this, well, is this I mean, primarily it was a vision event. This Dorfman. 88. Look oh, at that. Look at that big twist. It's funny with the audio because it's Ken Park announcing and his voice is all oh. cracking like the puberty kid on The Simpsons do the whole want, time. Do you want me to have the audio with this? No. Or? Okay. Just watch Because I kind of wanted your, your conversation. So, uh, oh, so, by the way, there's footage too where they're like, hey, what's going on, Gator? And he's like, maybe we should be praying right now instead of being sinners or something. And they're just like, okay, whatever, dude. And then it turns out that that was he's after he killed that chick, but before yeah. he turned himself in. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, maybe you need to be praying, Mark Anthony. So he puts up a 92, and that's what uh, Tony Hawk, I guess he had been behind on points. So he had to put up that at least that high or higher to, to have a, a runoff again. So that's if I remember right, I think Hasoy wins this one. You don't see Tony wear black too much yeah, either. Yeah, they uh, yeah Stacey Peralta made them all wear bowling jerseys. They're all wearing these like heavy black shirts under the hot lights, dying. That was a fakey frontside invert over the spot. <laughs> yeah, like a half cab invert. Oh, you know, the man. thing about this guy, oh, no. you know, people like make fun of him for selling out for bagel bites and club med and whatever the fuck kind of thing, which is all true, like sort of a corporate sort of image. But there's just no denying the skate ratness. That was a 720 dude. right there. Fake you to fake yeah, but then he lands all squat. That's that ain't like the chin ramp. I wanted to show you the chin ramp one where he yeah. lands. He just sticks it standing up perfect. But this like is in competition. So he ends up, uh, uh, you know, pretty much. If you're a skateboarder and you want to make money, you don't have a choice but to, right. you know, do, do sponsorships for these corporations, unfortunately. Well, and... You know what? Like it could have been that he was getting greedy and was like willing to sell out to anything or whatever and didn't see the harm in, in the way that some of us would like really not approve of some of the stuff that he was doing. But I got at the, the same answer time, for you. It's like, you know what? Here's a guy who tells himself you're staying on. And then he stays on. It's, Skateboarders it's, and libertarians it's, have a problem. You've got to give that more than that, though, Scott. If you look at it, he's been married four times. Uh, he, do not begrudge this man the the money that he needs to pay alimony. No shit and, in California. And, yeah, uh, Plus, I, I'm a family law attorney. I, I, this this is the first thing I thought of when I saw this. I'm like, I yeah. hope he had it a prenup. I don't know what's happening here. What's this? And why they leave him? They left him because he's like, I'm sorry, I'm dedicated to this skateboard, dude, and I'm going skateboarding. And I'm not keeps not married. going skateboarding. I'm going skateboarding. Yeah. Bye. You know. And he, you know, five days a week. They asked him. They're like, dude, how often do you skate? Five days a week. Skateboarding is a libertarian. Three, four hours a day, five he days just, a week. Like that's just his broke job. Just or doing a test tube babies. Yeah, yeah. So that and you know, skateboarding like, and skateboarders and libertarians both have a hard time gatekeeping, right? If like Vans could have had a great thing, but they decided to sell all all the board companies and, like I said, soft goods sold sold to corporate entities and, and instead of keeping it, and they could have kept their money. 
And this is the same thing with libertarians. This is how you end up with. Then they'd have Nicholas to keep Sar- working, though. <laughs> yeah, this is how you end up with Nicholas Sarwarks. You know, yeah. but you I, know, I, with Hawk, if you watch that new documentary about him, I mean, you can tell by the end of this thing where it's like, man, this guy's got some kind of disorder, right? Like this is um, <laughs> this is we all do if you're a skateboarder, you you're it, a masochist. Call it whatever you want, but like, uh, this guy is it, it. There is a compulsion here. Yeah, where. In a way where if you and I got broke off seven times, we might just go home and try again tomorrow. And this guy gets broke off seven times, and he's now more dedicated to landing the thing before he leaves tonight than he was earlier, you know, after slam three. And he and he is going to land whatever the fuck it is before he goes home tonight. And that's true. And he will. And he does. And then and it's like no matter what it is, um, and yeah, he's he's got obviously he's got the talent above anyone to be able to do whatever he wants. But the level of dedication there, right? Like that shit ain't easy, no matter who you are. Yeah. The level of dedication to get fucking wrecked. And like his ramp is 13 feet high, dude. That's makes the hurricane ramp, you know, look like the kids ramp. You know what I mean? The, the hurricane was like 11 and a half. This thing is 13. You, you go take seven, eight, ten slams on that in a day and keep getting up and climbing back up that ladder when you don't have to because you're already Tony Hawk and you're already the king of the world. You already <laughs> landed everything in the world there was to land. And there he is still trudging up that ladder, getting the shit done at 54 years old or whatever his problem is. And, like, I saw a thing where, um, you know that show The Nine Club where they interview yeah. pro skaters and stuff? <clears throat> yeah. And um, the way they're – and, look, he is from – eras ago so it's like it's fair enough or whatever but like these guys the street skaters are talking about him and they're like saw him at the barracks and he's working on doing frontside varial heel flips over the hip of this bank or whatever it was and they're like man i sat there and watched that man work and i saw him get worked and like take slams and and sit there and spend hours until he had it perfect perfect you know and like and they're like man it's pretty like he's not hanging out with anyone he's over there in his corner messing with his little varial heel flip a little street trick on a pyramid in his 50s and these pro street skaters are like god dang and then the guy i forgot his name chris something or other chris roberts who's the host of the nine club he's like no man i'm telling you i know that guy he there's a reason he's that good he is a skate rat like no one else in history dude you know, Christian Hosoy never had that level of dedication to skateboarding. No. Maybe Speaking nobody of, did, right? Rodney Mullen, you know, skates at night alone every night yeah. or something like that. But like, but I don't, I don't think that compares. Thir- maybe nobody he ain't in falling off a thirteen foot ramp. Yeah, and like <laughs> right. you mentioned the Animal right. Chin when they rebuilt the Chin ramp, and they all went and skated it. And and Peralta talks about how you can see with McGill and Mountain and Lance, they would try something and if it wasn't right they'd bail out and knee slide out you know and they're still trying awesome shit i mean lance is going for the lean air to grind up the extension like you just saw you know 35 years later whatever um but if it ain't right he bails out and stacy is like tony hawk on the other hand <laughs> he's like ride or die 100 percent slam or get. land never bail get. Ever, ever. And then they show him and he gets warded. He gets knocked out in the flat bottom because I forgot what it was. It's some kind of McTwist over the channel or some kind of thing. And he should have bailed. And instead of bailing, he over rotates and lands on his back and it's just, and he's knocked out cold. And Peralta is like, dude, chill, bro. Slow down. You're 54. You don't have to be as good as you ever were every day. Yeah. Maybe only on Thursdays you have to be as good as you ever were. But, like, it's okay to bail sometimes, homeboy. And But his thing is, no, slam or land, no bails ever. And like, Speaking I, of a... Uh, to me, that's the measure head. of a man. Like, what can I say, dude? That makes him the best human ever. To be Speaking that of level dumb. of skateboarding. And for that reason, that level of dedication, you know? Speaking of don't meet your heroes... Uh, Tony Hawk is looking rough these days. And I don't know if it's because of the slams or... His- or it's because he's been raising money for Democrat activist campaigns. Oh, but, no. Yeah. You really yeah I, was just, I always wanted to ask him, hey, man, you seem like such a smart guy. I wonder if you have any other interests in life. You know, like, of course, he's, he's a ma- fucking Democrat. He's been married. How four, imaginative, four times. dude. 
I don't think he I don't think he's necessarily a Democrat, but he has been doing raising money for Democrat activist campaigns, maybe naively. I don't know, uh, but he, he is he, from California. I, so. All I would say is he, he reminds me of Lance Armstrong without getting canceled in the drug problems, right? Where yeah. he's got this foundation. He's doing a lot of work. He's doing a lot of things. And you even when you listen to his podcast, the little things he treads lightly on um, that he just doesn't want to kind of get into. So I'll just sure. let him go. I would here. rather him tread lightly than than raise money for. I, I would I would prefer. <laughs> yes, I would prefer him be bold and brave. But we can take one thing out of this, which is and it's a shame they don't they, they see it in their own lives and then they don't expect it from others, which is the work hard. You talked about Lance Mountain. I, I had seen where he, when he finally got the McTwist, he said it took him like a month and a half straight of working on it when he finally finished and he, and he got it. He threw his helmet down. He was so pissed, not that he got it, but that it took him that long, but perseverance. So, yeah. um, you know, it, we could take that in all of our lives. Uh, for, Dude, for, for anybody and- still watching, I'm going to I'm gonna give you kudos here, Scott. To me, I've never seen Tim Pool skate in person, but as far as I'm concerned, I've seen videos of him skate. You're still better than he is, no matter what amount of flat, flat ground pair of am, flippy dippy. I am better than him. <laughs> Good, good to um, hear. Uh, last thing I'm he does say. have a mean hard flip though. I give the man credit, and you know he he got a when I skated with him, he got a kick flip to backside pivot on his mini ramp, which I cannot do. I've never done in my life. So, All credit. Maybe hopefully one day I can make it to Tim's show and and skate his mini ramp. I doubt I ever will. I'm too. It's a fun uh, ramp. It's really great. Super, I'm too antagonistic, but I I respect him he's a lot. Not, I know he's not looking some for garbage men, Andy. This uh, you and I are not going on that show. When Scott. he first started his show, he said he wanted to talk to garbage men. So well, don't put it past him. He had Pasoba. No, I shouldn't go there. I got to um, build my clout. <laughs> he said Charlie Kirk yeah. on, so I think he fulfilled that promise. Where, where's the best place to find it? Antiwar.com slash Justin. Okay. And by the way, Libertarian Institute, there's great, great stuff there. Scott's got a lot of stuff. Um, and we're going to put the, out a book of Justin's best, too, coming out probably next year. Andy, you've got a book coming out, right? Monkey Pox, <laughs> The Life and Times of a Super Spreader. Is that, is that <laughs> something like that? No, it's published uh, on Trans World. If you want to right. follow me, just regret every life decision you made. <laughs> but I've been trying to do more stuff on, on my Odyssey, and, and uh, I'm calling conservatives gay leftist on twitter so. there you go yeah. <laughs> um listen andy can ride the vert ramp i've seen him almost do a really nice frontside air a couple of times so wow. well when i first got up there i dropped in padless and was yeah. ready to rip and all these guys are like well what are you doing up there padless ready to drop in my five-year-old daughter's sitting there right there well at the time she was four so yeah i don't nah, know man, that's good I knew from the beginning, as soon as I saw you skateboard, you got skills, man. You just need practice. I'll um, smoke you. I'll every smoke Sunday you on and, the- and Austin Vert Dogs, look me up, man. I'll smoke you on that uh, new pump track, but on the Vert Ramp, you got me beat. You know what? You did smoke me on the pump track yesterday. I don't <laughs> think that you can really speak in the future tense like that about how it's going to be from here on out. I'm going to clip that out of context for everyone, anyway. just so you know. Uh, Scott, where can people find you? What what, what do you have coming up? Uh, throw your plugs out here, and then we'll head out. Yeah, man, I'm uh, scotthorton.org for the show, and that's um, iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify and all those things for the Scott Horton Show. Uh, 5,700-something interviews going back to 2003 for you there, which might be a world record. I don't know. Um, Take that. And that's all at youtube.com slash Scott Horton show and at odyssey.com slash something slash Scott Horton show, however that works. Um, and then I'm the editorial director of antiwar.com. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute. And I wrote four books Fool's Errand, Enough Already, The Great Ron Paul, and the brand new one is Hotter Than the Sun Time to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And all that is available at scotthorton.org slash books. I've read enough already. I will get on the next ones. Uh, Andy, I appreciate you being on. Scott, uh, it's been a uh, sorry I didn't mention uh, or meet you in Reno. I was there. You were ranting to other oh, really? people. I'm sorry. I, I was I next was, time. Next time, it'll be my it'll be my duty. I was so, ranting. I remember that. Yeah, that yeah, did happen. Something once. about cops in a Starbucks and something else. I saw that. Ah, uh, yeah. But we'll, <laughs> we'll let it be there. I, I appreciate it uh, for for coming on and um, hang on. We're gonna have an unnecessarily long outro. Thanks, everybody, for joining this show. And Andy, see you at the ramp on Sunday. There you go. Okay, I'm leaving now, my guys. But she's back. And now. Chick-fil-A is completely overrated. It's not that good. I prefer Zaxby's. I prefer Popeye's. 
takes a tough man to make a tender forecast, Nick. And I guess that's me. <laughs> Keep fucking that chicken. For, should I vote for Dick Cheney on the Libertarian Party? Do yes. I have an obligation to vote for Dick Cheney? I would say so. Yes. Well, did it work for those people? <laughs> no, it never does. I mean, these people somehow delude themselves into thinking it might, but... <laughs> But it might work for us. That one dude was like, not a podcast, I can't find it anywhere, and they don't have a video. <laughs> oh, yeah, Peter Janky, yeah. He's yeah, like, I blocked him. I'll do it. If he unblocks me, I'll... I'll... <laughs> He'll buy your shirt if you unblock him, Bert. He's a wigger. Yeah, nothing cooler than so a 49-year-old wigger. Like, yeah, I just started I live streaming. Cut me some slack. I'm fucking... I'm pretty high-tech for a boomer. Uh, but anyways, I...